June. Dear Danny, I wish you could see the Danger Gang headquarters, my treehouse. It's looking cooler than ever. We all meet there once a week after school to eat sweets, practice saying, it's danger time. Okay, that's mostly me. And discuss any crazy new things that might have happened. And yes, more things have happened since my last letter. Charlie's mum works at the newsagents at the end of my street, right next to the pet shop. And she lets Charlie have whatever he wants, so he always stops by the shop after our meetings and grabs loads of top snackage to keep our brains fueled for our chats. Four cho- choco toffee chews and a tub of Nutter Crunch ice cream for me every time. Three key things have happened since my last letter. First, Molly has learned to control when she disappears and reappears. She's worked out that she can do it whenever she wants just by doing this weird little twitch with her nose. I am beyond jealous. Second, to balance out that awesome discovery, here's some significantly less awesome news. Ronnie Nutbug, aka Bumface, now comes to our weekly meetings. I know. Since the food fight and him being nice to Molly, the gang took a vote and everyone else decided to give him a chance. So I had no choice. Plus, (coughs) I suppose that is the right thing to do. But I've told him that he's one wrong move away from being boosted out of a treehouse and have since added ejector seat to the top of the list of things to install when I eventually get to phase two of the build. Third, I went to my first party here in Freaky, and it was a night I will never forget. It was Charlie Campbell's party. He lives on my street too at number 16, and he's a member of the Danger Gang. He's also crazy about dangerous animals. It's all he blabs on about. When I'm older, I want a pet cobra, he says, every day. Aren't they poisonous? asks Catty. Every day. You mean venomous, he corrects her, every day. Susie said he's been into weird and dangerous animals for as long as she's known him, and those two were born in Freaky, so I guess that's a pretty long time. On the night of his birthday, his mum and dad were taking us all to the fairground in the park, and after that we were going to his place for a sleepover. I was so looking forward to going. You know how much I love sleepovers. Remember that time I slept at your house and we ordered pizza and they accidentally delivered two pizzas instead of one? That might be still the best night of my life. I love pizza. Where was I? Oh, at the fairground. It was only stopping and freaky for one night, so everyone in town was there. By the time we arrived, the sun was setting, all the neon lights were on, and the air smelled so good I could have had it for dinner. Actually, I did have it for dinner. We ate candy floss, roasted caramel and nuts, tri- triple fudge donuts, hot dogs, lollipops, and I had a toffee apple just to make sure I got one of my five a day. Everyone wanted to go on the ghost train, but I said I'd already been on the ghost train last year when the fair came to my old time town and it would just be boring to ride it again. But Ronnie Nutbog said I was scared and that I would probably pee my pants with fright on the ride, so I went on it to prove I wasn't afraid. I didn't pee my pants. I did spill my slushy on my trousers though, so it looked like I did. But I didn't. I wasn't even scared. You know how brave I am. I dried off my slushy wet trousers by riding the teacups and running nutbogs spun, spun us round so fast it made Jamelia puke. Mr and Mrs Campbell said we need to calm down before we went back to Charlie's house, so they bought us all freshly popped sweet and salty popcorn out of one of those big machines that smell awesome and we all went on the Ferris wheel, which turned out to be pretty cool because you could see the top of our houses. On the way to his house, Charlie revealed loads of big plans for his sleepover. I'm going to ask Molly to turn invisible. Then she can secretly throw a cup of water on Eric to transform him into a shark. And we can see if we can use his heightened shark senses to track her down, he whispered excitedly to me. My heart sank. That sounded so epic. I mean, it's not very often that you get to have a sleepover with an invisible friend and a shark. But my inner super spy instincts knew that I had to make these dreams vanish quicker than Molly in a maths test when we got to Charlie's house. I broke the news that the sleepover was to remain a shark-free zone. Why? he asked. Eric turning into a shark, Molly turning invisible. We have to keep these things top secret. You of all should people should know that. What's that Danger's number one rule about secrets, I asked, knowing full well that any true Zack Danger fan would know this. Secrets aren't secrets if you don't keep them secret, he sighed, quoting Zack Danger in the secret traitor word for word. Exactly. We need to keep this information to ourselves. Just the danger gang. So no liquids are to be consumed around Eric tonight. And Molly needs to promise to stay visible the whole time, I said. 
As if my new rules for Charlie's sleepover weren't bad enough, the moment we stepped into Charlie's house, Mr and Mrs Campbell handed out a sheet of their own sleepover rules that they'd even had laminated in plastic to make, make them indestructible, which is a terrible way to start a party. No TV, no rock, rap, dance music, only pop, no jumping on the sofa, bed, each other. No fun. Someone should tell grown-ups that decorating rules with glittery stars doesn't make them any less lame. Once Mr and Mrs Campbell had disappeared into the kitchen, I quickly scribbled my own danger gang rules at the bottom. No drinking water around Eric, no turning invisible. And explained the whole secrets aren't secret unless we keep the secret thing. And we all made a danger gang promise. So a few minutes later, there we were, sitting on Charlie's living room floor, playing past the parcel like a bunch of five-year-olds, listening to music by some ancient band that the grown-ups seemed to like that I'd never heard of. There was a huge sigh of relief when Charlie's dad said, Present time! Now here's the thing. Remember I told you that Charlie is animal mad? Well, for almost as long as the Danger Gang has existed, Charlie has been banging on about how he's going to get a pet for his birthday. But he doesn't know what sort of animal it is. It's a surprise, so we've all been guessing. A venomous snake, a scary rottweiler, a monkey, a bird-eating spider, an alligator, two alligators. Okay, some of our guesses were a bit out there, but it was Charlie, and he was obsessed with these kind of bitey, stingy, deadly animals. So it was pretty exciting waiting to see what super awesome animal Charlie was going to be calling his pet as we gather round to watch him open his presents. The first boxes contained the usual stuff, pyjamas, a new lunchbox... To be honest, it was a total snore fest until his dad brought out the final present. I don't know why parents always leave the best present until last. When do they all get together to decide to do this? It's like leaving your favourite bit of dinner until the end. By the time you get to it, you're so full of presents that you can't eat anymore. Wait, why am I talking about eating presents? You know what I mean. Anyway, Charlie's dad carried his last present out in a special box with holes in the top and we all knew that could mean only one thing. There was something alive inside. Charlie tore open the box with an enormous smile on his face. Was it a deadly venomous snake? The world's most stingy jellyfish? A baby alligator that he could train to bite his enemies in the playground? Charlie reached inside and we all stepped back as he pulled out the fluffiest furball any of us had ever seen. A hamster. What a letdown. All those precious minutes we'd spent imagining our friend owning some sort of awesome creature from the jungle or the depths of a swamp, and it turned out to be a ball of fur from Freaky Pets, the pet shop at the end of our road. On the other hand, it was at least four times fluffier than a regular hamster, and it had bright green eyes. What kind of hamster is it, Mr Campbell? I've never seen one like this, asked Katie, who knew loads about hamsters because she has two of her own. Well, the man at the pet store wasn't quite sure himself. You see, these hamsters just appeared in his shop the other month, as if by magic. He had no clue where they came from, Mr Campbell explained. What do you mean he didn't know one of his hamsters was pregnant and the hamster babies in the night? Katie asked. No, it's the strangest story. He told me that he'd sold all his hamsters that day and the cages were empty when he locked up in the evening. There was a big lightning storm later, so he came in early to check on the animals. And when he opened up, he found a cage full of these fluffy little things. Well, I bet you're thinking that my heart pounded in my chest when he mentioned the lightning storm. And you're right. It was going boom, boom, boom. And as I looked around my friends, I could tell their hearts were boom, boom, booming too. Could the hamster have appeared because of that storm? What are you going to call him? Mrs Campbell trilled. Charlie didn't know. I think he had loads of ideas for rottweilers and snakes and bird-eating spiders, but not so many for fluffy hamsters. I have an idea. Let's each write a name on a piece of paper and fold it in half. Then we'll put our hamster names in a bowl. And Charlie, you can pick one at random, suggested Mrs Campbell, rushing to get some paper and pens. We all scribbled down our ideas and dropped them into the bowl. My hamster will officially be known as... Charlie said as he plunged his hand into the bowl and had written... You, and would you believe it, he pulled out the name I had written. Gangster the Hamster, Charlie announced. Everyone laughed and said what a cool name Gangster was for a hamster. Everyone except the grown-ups. Gangster isn't a real name, Charlie. You'll have to choose a different name from the bowl, Mr Party Pooping Campbell said. So Charlie chose again, which is totally out of order if you ask me. My hamster's new name is 
Mr Fluffles, Charlie read out, and his, this time his parents looked relieved. Mr Fluffles isn't a real name either, I argued. Charlie can call his hamster whatever he likes, Mrs Campbell said. Except gangster, I replied, and she gave me a look that seemed to have the same effect as Mum's kid shut her upper. Charlie let Mr Fluffles run around on the floor for a bit and we all watched. He was so cute, but pretty boring. Mr Fluffles didn't really do anything, so Ronnie flicked a piece of leftover popcorn from the fairground towards him and we watched the hamster store it in his cheap pouch. That was about as exciting as Mr Fluffles got. Charlie sighed with disappointment at not getting something remotely wild or dangerous. I guess Mr Campbell realised as he scooped up Mr Fluffles and put him back in his cage to take up to Charlie's bedroom. As it's a special day, he announced before he left, you can stay up until midnight. Win! I don't know if they were letting us stay up late to make up for Charlie getting a hamster instead of an alligator, but it made us all really excited because everyone knows that the best things happen at midnight. Plus, I've been starting to worry about Mr and Mrs Campbell might be parent box set to boring mode and that Charlie was in need of rescuing from life of laminated rules and awful pet names, so I can at least put that out of my mind now. At about 11 o'clock, us boys got into our sleeping bags in Charlie's living room. The girls were sleeping upstairs in Charlie's bedroom. Mr and Mrs Campbell checked on us one last time. Remember, lights out when the big clock dongs midnight, Mr Campbell said, pointing to the grandfather clock standing in the corner of the room. And we all nodded politely before they went up to bed. The moment we heard the bedroom door shut, we pulled out the snacks we'd secretly stuffed in the bottom of our sleeping bags. I can't believe parents don't know about that trick yet. I bought the classic jumbo bag of marshmallows and a slightly squished but delicious choco glazed donut. Eric had jelly babies and Ronnie had steak flavoured crisps. Weird choice. But then Charlie laughed at us as he unlocked and opened a door just off his living room to reveal a cupboard full of sweets. It's beautiful, whispered Eric. It's amazing, I added. Mumbled Ronnie through a mouthful of crisps. It's all the stock from Mum's shop, Charlie grinned. You stole the key, Eric gasped. Don't be daft. She always lets me have the key on my birthday. Dig in. With that, he dived into a sugary cave of wonders. We were all whispering until Charlie told us that his dad snores so loudly that his mum has to sleep with earplugs in so he could make as much noise as he liked and they'd never wake up. Mr and Mrs Campbell were quickly becoming the coolest parents ever. We chatted and laughed and we shared out handfuls of jelly beans and Smarties and crisps and... Dong! Midnight. It has sneaked up on us like a wizard wearing an invisibility cloak. And in the corner of the room, the old grandfather clock was chiming in its order to go to bed. With no chance of waking Mr and Mrs Campbell, we just ignored the chimes of the clock. Until, shh, Ronnie hushed us. Do you hear that? We all listened. As the clock dinged its last dong, the bells turned into screams. It's the girls upstairs, Eric gasped. He was right. They were screaming. Me, Charlie, Ronnie and Eric legged up the stairs as fast as we could, ready to be the heroes that saved the sleepover. Frankie Brown slaves, saved sleepover. But the moment we crashed through Charlie's bedroom door, he skidded to a stop at the sight in front of us. <laughs>